And so we bring before God our gifts. Recognizing all that he has done for us. Recognizing the great way uh, that he has blessed our lives. First and foremost, through Jesus Christ. On this Sunday, October 31st, on Halloween, when uh, there might soon be people coming to your door to uh, ring the bell and say, trick or treat. We are mindful that our Heavenly Father only treats, no tricks. And while folks might have uh, put up some scary decorations and uh, might be watching some movies that have some gory themes, we're reminded on this day, as we bring our offerings, that Christ offered up Himself and that we have been washed by His blood. And it's not a horror movie, it's a love story. And that He has loved us so much and has blessed us so abundantly that we now bring our gifts before Him. In humble and gratitude and appreciation, we offer up who we are, what we are, what we have, and to say, here am I. How can I be used? Whether it's within the walls of the church, in our communities around the world, whether it's sharing our gifts locally or globally, as we continue to seek ways that we can praise Him for all that He has done. With that in mind, would you join me in a prayer of blessing on these gifts. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done through Jesus Christ and the opportunity that you give us even now to sacrificially give of ourselves, to offer ourselves back to you, to, in, in gratitude and in recognition of all that you have done, to offer ourselves that we could be used, that others can know the joy and the love we've known, that they can know the forgiveness and the grace that we've known, that they may experience the mercy that has been lavished on us. Father, use whatever we have, in whatever way you see fit, where, when. Father, we present ourselves living sacrifices. Receive these gifts. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I invite you to join with me in singing our hymn. If you're using one of the hymnals from Scotch Plains Baptist Church, this is hymn number 74 in that hymnal. It's also in your worship packet. I sing the almighty power of God. Um, I sing the almighty power of God, hymn number 74. <laughs>
pastoral prayer with that, with that psalm in our mind about all God is and all that God does. The line kind of right in the middle there. Lord, how your wonders are displayed where'er my eye may, where'er I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky, no matter where we look, whether we're looking down, looking up, looking sideways, looking back, looking forward, He's there and we can see what He has done. We are mindful of His blessing and everything that He has touched and put in place for us. And so, in just a moment, we are going to offer our praise and and offer our request. We're going to lift these things before Him. Um, as we do that, I just I just have to pause a moment. Um, I I don't do this nearly enough. Um, but I want to offer praise and appreciation um, for my wife, who has been working like crazy for a year and a half to help us do what we do uh, in, in worship. Um, again, some of you know we don't have a furnace uh, currently operating in the sanctuary due to the flooding, and it is cold in here, and she's sitting down there wrapped in a blanket. She asked last night, why didn't I take a heater uh, with me? Um, it is in the very low 60s. Uh, in here right now, and she's stuck sitting. She can't even you know, roam, roam, roam around to warm up so much because she's got a couple of laptops and uh, multiple screens that she's got to uh, be dealing with. And <clears throat> this morning, I wasn't yet in the shower, and she was leaving to come over here to get everything set up. Um, and when we're done, she's got to take it all down. Last Sunday, uh, I wanted to film uh, a chapel segment. That's another thing that you don't necessarily recognize that she's been for a year and a half now filming our chapel segments so that we can put them on YouTube so the teachers can watch them in their classrooms because we can't gather as a whole school, whole school together. Um, well, last week, I didn't want just one camera. I wanted five cameras. And so after the worship service, moved everything that's set up here and relocated cameras all around and filmed, and while we're filming, she's holding up cue cards for me with the scripture verses that I wanted to use. Um, and then when we were done with that, uh, and what, what it was was I was carving in Jesus' land. It's something that I've been doing for I don't know how many years. It's also up on the Scotch Plains Baptist YouTube. You might want to check that out. Um, you might want to share it with somebody, pass it on to somebody else. Um, when we were done with that, I was done. Uh, and I ran out to get stuff set up for crop walk. Meanwhile, she took down the five cameras and took down the table and the tripods and repositioned the stands for the cameras that we needed to get for today. Um, took down the table, vacuumed the sanctuary, um, took everything home, put all those onto the computer so that when I got home, she could get them onto my computer so that I could do the editing that she taught me how to edit videos. Uh, and then, when it was time to finish the video, uh, I asked her if she could make me slides to put in with the scripture verses, because I'm not real good at that kind of thing, and I certainly don't type very fast with one finger at a time. And she did all of those, uh, and showed me how to get those into the uh, editing. Uh, and then, <laughs> she got to uh, upload it to YouTube, because I am not good at that kind of thing either. Uh, and though she did leave me, I asked her to leave me notes, and she left me a whole page of notes of, if it doesn't work, this is what you do. And then, I found out that, for whatever reason, our day school director wasn't able to open it on her computer, and they spent, I don't know how many um, emails and texts back and forth trying to get that figured out um, as well. Uh, so, earlier I was talking to the folks who were on Zoom and were here in the sanctuary about, uh, somebody had asked how we put everything together on Sunday mornings, and I said, basically, I still do what I've always done, um, and my wife does a ton of things before, during, and after, and all I have to do is just stand here and talk. Um, so I just wanted to, as, as part of our, our prayer today, um, offer that up, because frankly, we, I could not do this um, as we've been doing for a year and a half, and I just wanted to make sure that folks know that, and that, that that's part of my prayer. As we, as we go together in prayer. Uh, and it's a ministry on behalf of the, the entire uh, 
congregation. And hopefully, uh, if, you're, if you're seeing this, you're being blessed because of what she is doing. Um, uh, as she says, she works a full-time job and then works another job here. So we bring together our, our prayer requests, and, and uh, folks have asked me to be praying for uh, particularly the safety of, of people who, uh, kids who might be out trick-or-treating, uh, and, and we often think of the kids that are running across the street, but you know there's parents that are out there with them too that are, are making those hikes, um, and they might, particularly as it gets a little darker, they might have made sure that their kids have flashlights or reflective, whatever, but sometimes the parents forget um, and are just wearing whatever they were wearing that day. Um, so safety for them as well. Um, we also had some uh, requests for uh, family members who have had some medical issues um, for the granddaughter of a friend with a, a recent leukemia, uh, a friend's granddaughter, um, who had a leukemia diagnosis um, for appreciation for those who participated in, in crop walk, um, for those who are celebrating milestones for um, those who are, are getting medical treatments and, and setting things up, um, uh, getting getting answers um, and moving forward. Uh, so we have a lot of things that are already on our, our prayer list. Uh, and certainly you have things that you are praying for as well, things that um, are on your heart, the blessings that you receive and you want to offer praise and, and challenges that you might be facing and perhaps challenges that you haven't shared with anybody else, you haven't shared with the church family, um, maybe you've shared with a, a, a prayer partner or something, um, but we, we pray for those as well. We don't need to know the specifics and we don't even need to know who's got it. Um, we know it's out there and we offer it up to God because God hears those prayers even when they are uh, kind of kept in our hearts. So with that in mind, I invite you to please join me in prayer. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for so many blessings, opportunities that you've given us to, to see you, whether we're looking down at the ground or we're looking up at the stars, to see you and to see love and beauty, to see truth, to see in our interactions with our brothers and sisters, to see how you move and how you bless, to hear in their testimony the ways in which you have touched lives in, in sometimes dramatic and sometimes unexpected ways. And since we've seen these things and we've heard these things, we have learned that we can trust you, that we can count on you. And so when we have a challenge, when we have a trouble, when we have a concern, when it's our family that's being affected, when we've heard the headlines and we call out to you, we do so boldly and in confidence. We do so not as a last resort, but in full confidence that our God wants to hear, wants to know, wants to move. And so we bring before you these things. We bring before you medical situations and financial circumstances. We bring job experiences and we bring classroom challenges. We bring before you the generations of our families and we recognize that every generation has its different joys and its different challenges. That each phase of life comes with something new. And we have the choice to Look at the negative, but look at the positive. And Father, we turn them all over to you and ask you to help us to see the good, to see the joy, to find the positive, to experience gratitude and appreciation, to experience wonder and awe at all that you do. And so, Father, we bring ourselves, our church, our nation, we bring our families, our communities, our world, we bring all that we are, our inward and our outward, and we offer it before you. And we say, hear this, Lord. Hear this as my prayer, offered in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I 
I came home the other day. Uh, can't remember exactly what the circumstances where I was, but I, I, I came in and uh, the TV was on in the family room, and, and Ashley was watching. And <clears throat> it's it's that time of year when uh, all the reruns are on um, showing their, their Halloween episodes. And what was on TV was one of those um, kind of nostalgia channels. And it had on Happy Days with a, uh, a Halloween party that the, the gang had gone to. And I was astounded to know that my daughter had never seen an episode of Happy Days. She knew the song, Monday, Tuesday, she knew the song, she did not know the show. She did not know the character. She did not know Fonzie. She thought he was supposed to be Zuko from Greece. Um, she found out that Ron Howard, Richie Cunningham, well, she knows him. She knows some of the films, the later films that he directed. So she knows him as a director. She didn't know he was an actor. She didn't know anything about that. And I was kind of, kind of amazed by that, that she didn't know that. Um, so then a great discussion about you know, some of those, those old shows that some of you remember as not being so old. Um, and the discussion turned to one of my wife's favorite shows of that era, uh, MASH. Um, and that she goes, yeah, that's the Army one, right? Um, that's about all she knew about that one. Um, but she knows the, the theme song from her, uh, which, which is interesting to me. Ashley likes a lot of music. Uh, again, a wide range of stuff. And one of the things that, that it's interesting to me that, that uh, we have come home and she'll be doing her chores clean in the house or whatever, um, and she'll have music playing through the Alexa device, and she has asked for the movie themes channel. And so it's, it's I mean, and not the soundtracks that have the lyrics that, um, you know, because let's face it, some movies have some great soundtracks, some good uh, radio play stuff, but the instrumental stuff, and she knows what movies they are. Um, and she'll, she'll talk about, oh, that's from such and such. Oh, you know that because this happens in it. Uh, I, I can't do that. I, I, I'm not gonna, I mean, I can get probably um, Chariots of Fire. Uh, and maybe Darth Vader's theme. Uh, that might be about it for me for movie themes if there's no lyrics um, to them. And, and she was doing it again last night. We got in the, in the van, she was going to a, a party, um, and she asked, I actually, actually, we were listening to it when she was going to the party, that's when the conversation happened. Earlier in the day, when we were the snowshoe practice, she asked, can we put on, on the satellite radio the Halloween channel? It's one of those special pop-up channels that's only on for a few weeks, and they play themes from horror movies, and they play sound effects. Well, when I was a kid, we had an album, an LP, that my mother bought that we would put on the big st console stereo system, and it was spooky sound effects, and so it's feet clomping across the floor, or an owl hooting, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and the occasional shriek or the, the, the evil laugh kind of thing. Uh, and, and we would put that album on and listen to it, and, and particularly on the 31st when trick-or-treaters might come, we would put that on and blast it. Um, and apparently my wife's family, her brother Doug, would do the same thing uh, at, at Halloween time. But there's actually a radio station, that's all it is, on the satellite radio. So we found it, we put it on. Um, and listen to it on the way to practice and back, and, and a lot of just kind of weird sound effects. Um, they did have a segment where kids were ringing the doorbell and trick or treat, and the guy didn't have any candy, so he would tell bad jokes as, as the treat. Uh, jokes that I found very funny, um, but kids would not. Um, so was it a trick or treat? Who knows? Uh, we're coming back from this party last night at Picker Up, and we're listening to this, and again, she kept identifying uh, on the way to the party and on the way back the different movies that the themes were from. And then she got to talking about movies and what makes 
a horror movie soundtrack, a horror movie soundtrack. And I don't know where she gets this stuff. She started talking about classical music and how in classical music there are themes. And certain instruments and certain themes make you think certain ways. And how many of those themes you can find in current horror movies that's something that Beethoven or Bach or somebody used, that a modern composer is putting in. Where does she come up with this? And about how just hearing some of those notes automatically puts you in a scary frame of mind. And I was just, where does that come from? And then I got to thinking, actually it was on the way over this morning when I was thinking about all this, uh, about how this all fits together. When she was little, we used to watch that Disney film Fantasia all the time. And there are, and it talks about how music sets moods and themes. And I think that she was getting a musical education in that. So whether it was uh, Night on Bald Mountain or um, Rise, Flight of the Valkyries, I think that was influencing her discussion last night. And so this, this listening to some of this stuff. Now, there were some songs that would show up on this station. It wasn't all um, movie themes, it wasn't all instrumental, it wasn't all, all sound effects, but some songs that, that showed up. And there's certain songs that are going to be in the rotation at Halloween. Um, and the other day, I actually, I, I was... <laughs> because I am who I am. I was looking up um, best Halloween songs uh, and going through them. And some of the ones that you would expect showed up uh, on the list. And um, Billboard apparently puts out every couple of years um, their, their Halloween songs. Um, and you're going to find things, it seems like on number one on all this list is Michael Jackson's Thriller. Uh, it's going to be the number one Halloween song. Uh, and there's going to be some obvious ones, uh, like the novelty song, Monster Mash. Uh, been around for a long time. Uh, but then the, the song from the 80s, uh, Somebody's Watching Me, uh, showed up. Uh, Ghostbusters shows up on a bunch of those lists, movie things. Uh, some, that, again, novelty ones, uh, they're, they're coming to take me away. Um, I guess because it shows up on there. Uh, one that I would not have thought of as a Halloween song, but I, it, I guess because it mentions the devil. Um, Charlie Daniels, Devil Went Down to Georgia. Not particularly a Halloween song, but I guess because it mentions the devil, it makes it on the list. But I found one that um, I looked at it and I said, well, how in the world is that a Halloween song? Well, it's because it uses the word spirit. It was Spirit in the Sky. Um, Spirit in the Sky, I don't know if you remember this one, it came out in 1969. So I listen to a lot of 70s uh, station in the car and it shows up in there quite frequently um, because it was recorded in 68, was released in 69, charted in 69, actually went way up the chart, got to number three uh, on the Hot 100 Billboard charts. Um, in 1970, and it, 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 it's, one, it's a sing-along kind of song. It comes on, you kind of tap your foot and, and sing with it. Um, here, here's how the words go. When I die and they lay me to rest, gonna go to the place that's the best. When I lay down to die, going up to the spirit in the sky. I guess because it talks about dying and, and spirit, that's what makes it a Halloween song. I, I don't see it. I never thought of it that way before until I saw it on this list the other day. Um, going up to the spirit in the sky. That's where I'm going to go when I die. When I die and they lay me to rest, I'm going to go to the place that's the best. Um, the next verse, prepare yourself. You know it's a must. Gotta have a friend in Jesus. So you know that when you die, he's going to recommend you to the spirit in the sky. Oh, he'll recommend you to the spirit in the sky. That's where you're going to go when you die. When you die, they lay you to rest. You're going to go to the place that's the best. Now, a fascinating trivia thing that every time it comes on, this, this comes into my mind. 
If you know who wrote that song, uh, it was Norman Greenbaum. It might not come to a surprise with a name like Norman Greenbaum. Norman is Jewish. And he was actually inspired to write this song because he was watching um, Porter Wagner uh, show on TV. Remember Porter Wagner used to have that variety show? That's where Dolly Parton got introduced. Actually, when she started on this show, she was still Norma Jean uh, before she became Dolly Parton uh, on Porter Wagner. And Porter Wagner sang on one of his shows a song about a preacher. And Norman Greenbaum was watching that and said, I could write a song like that. And so influenced by um, gospel music, influenced by folk music, he wrote what was essentially a gospel type song. Um, he later said uh, in an interview with Rolling Stone magazine, he said, I'm just some Jewish musician who really dug gospel music. I decided there was a larger Jesus gospel market out there than a Jehovah one. Um, later he said that when he, when he wrote the song, he kind of worked it so that it would sell. And he figured there weren't a whole lot of people that wanted Jewish gospel music, but Jesus gospel music, they would buy. Um, another interesting uh, bit of trivia about it is that the Los Angeles um, Angels baseball team, uh, when their lineup is announced for home games, they play an instrumental version of this, Spirit in the Sky. And they do, I thought that that was pretty interesting. Um, again, the song made number three um, in the U.S., but it was a number one song in Australia, in Ireland, in Germany, um, in Canada, and actually in the U.K. It charted at number one in 1970, and then in 1986, and then in 2003, as different remakes of it came out. Um, so it's been out there. I never really heard of it as a Halloween song, though. Um, but the challenge is, while a form was put together of a gospel song, it really doesn't have a gospel message. The words kind of sound like they should. And again, it's kind of a tone that fits the genre. But it kind of misses the point. When it talks about, um, you got to have a friend in Jesus. He'll recommend you to the Spirit in the sky. Yeah, that's, that's close, but not quite there. It's got some of the right pieces, but it ha doesn't quite go all the way. It, 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 it kind of makes me think of the scripture that we're going to use today. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark chapter 12. Beginning at verse 28. Now, recently, we talked about um, the story that you maybe learned in Sunday school class as a, as a child. About the, the rich young ruler who came and what do I have to do? And, and Jesus said, well, you know, what, what's the, what, what are the commandments? Well, I, I've always kept the commandments. I, I do all that. Um, yeah, I, I'm a good guy. All right, well, you're close. One thing you lack, and remember what he told you, sell all your stuff and come follow me. Um... And we had that a couple weeks ago, and so we found out that he was close, but not quite there. And then we had, uh, last week, we talked about Jesus being challenged by the religious leaders, the authorities, and demanding to know by what authority he did what he did. And he gave them some question, a question back, and they, they couldn't answer it, uh, wouldn't answer it. And so he refused to engage with them. They'd come to test him, to trick him, to get him in trouble, and he wasn't going there, and he actually turned the table so that no matter what they said, they would be in trouble with somebody. And then we get to this story in Mark chapter 12. And I, I like how this starts off, because it, it kind of in, in juxtaposition to that whole group, that whole gang that came to interrogate Jesus. So one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Now, there's some intervening stuff and they're talking about marriage and, and, and heaven and that kind of thing. Um, and whose wife will this be? But one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them. Now, I like that. One of the teachers came and heard them debate. Now, I don't know if he was part of the group that was there to challenge him, 
or if he was someone else, and he's listening to what's going on, but then he notices. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. Now, I, I wonder if maybe he is somebody who was part of the group that was there put this guy to the test to, to let the point him out as a fraud, to, to show him up, to get him in trouble, to get the crowds to turn against him. And I wonder if he'd never really heard Jesus. I wonder if all he'd heard was people talking about Jesus. And he'd never given Jesus a fair hearing. And you said, well, how, how can that be? Well, it happens to us all the time. We tend to hear the voices we want to hear. We tune into the, the news station that tells the news. They all say they're unbiased, but we know that every one of them is biased. We tend to tune into the one that's biased the way we want it to be biased, that reinforces our worldview. And so we hear that over and over. Or you hear from somebody about an event that you really weren't familiar with, and they tell you their version of it, and you, well, that you get indignant, you get upset. I can't believe they did that. You mean the schools are doing that? You mean your boss did that? How could that have happened? And you don't actually hear from the other side. I wonder if this teacher of the law was somebody who had heard the rumblings about Jesus and was behind the closed doors where they talked about Jesus, where they said, we got to deal with this Jesus. Let's go out there. And maybe he's just part of the mob coming to deal with this issue. But now he hears... And he notices that guy's giving a good answer. Maybe this teacher is saying that guy's giving a better answer than these guys over here could have given. Maybe now his eyes are open to things. And so with that in mind, he asks him. Now, I don't think, and I could be totally wrong on this. That's all right. You read the scripture, you come to your own conclusions. I don't think he's trying to test Jesus here. I mean, so often we get people testing Jesus. I don't think that's what's happening. Noticing that he gave him a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, I don't know if that's because this is one of those things that the teachers of the law would sit around and argue about. Kind of like seminary students can sit there and have long discussions about conversations that people in the pews would never have a discussion about. I wonder if this is one of the things they talked about when they were at their conferences. That they had different speakers stand up to argue about which commandment is the most important. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, verse 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the most important. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, we can do a whole sermon series on these verses right here. And we can talk about how what it boils down to is one word. Love. Love God. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we can, even when we boil that down to one word, love, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. Identify that God is love. There's a, a song we used to sing at camp. Love, 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 love. The gospel in a word is love. And I think that if we want to bottom line it, that's the word that Jesus is giving to this teacher. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Love. And again, we can diagnose this, break it down, we can do all sorts of things with it, but let's just leave it there at love. Verse 32, the man replies, Well said, teacher. Well said, teacher. This is somebody who 
In the normal reading of the gospel, whenever we see teacher of the law, we want to boo. One of the bad guys. It's one of the black hats. Maybe the theme music would be darker. There would be certain instruments and notes and tones that would be used when the teacher of the law shows up. But here, the man replies, well said, teacher. We don't get that aspect very often, do we? Well said, teacher. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but Him. Again, that's that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he gets in verse 33, the other part of that. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is kind of a radical thought. Or at least the way we're... The, Teachers of the law are portrayed in the Gospels because they're typically portrayed as being opposite of Jesus, being antagonistic. And then we get Nicodemus slipping in there. But to say that this love is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. See, the people have been conditioned into the rules and rituals, into following the most detailed instructions, and finding out this is a violation, this is a taboo, you can't do this. If you do this, now you're unclean. Now you have this to become clean again. That if you do this, it's okay, but if you do this, it's a sin, and if you do this sin, then you gotta make up for it in this way. And the whole system of ritual, of offerings, of sacrifices, of feast days and prayers had taken the place of a relationship, had taken the place of love. But this teacher of the law hears in Jesus what is well said and what is right. And he recognizes in the words of Jesus something that stands out against the words of ritual and form and going through the motions. And this speaks to me because I, at heart, am a legalist. There are things you must do and things you cannot do. And it has to be this way. And I like to see things in black and white, right or wrong, good or bad. And like this teacher of the law, I need to hear Jesus say, it's not those things, it's love. The greatest commandment isn't some rule that's been passed down, it's an attitude. It's a mindset. It's who you are, not what you do or what you say or how you say it. It's what goes behind all of I'm not a fan of Halloween. Because I think there's some, some baggage that comes with it. But as I was saying to somebody recently, I am a fan of creativity. I am a fan of fun. I am a, a fan of experience. But a lot of stuff about Halloween doesn't really suit me. but I'm not making hard and fast rules. Well, there's, there's some. If a pumpkin gets carved at my house, it's going to have a smile on the face on it. 
those scary things. Can decorate no no witches. No ghosts. Can decorate with other things. Bats, because my wife's really into bats and how bats are beneficial and all that. Bats come to my house, there are bats displayed year-round. I mean not literal bats, but images of bats and things displayed year-round. Uh, it's not because I think vampires turn into bats or something like that. It, 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 it took me a while to get the flexibility to do that. Um, because I tend to want to see it's a yes or no proposition. It took me a while to find out that there's a, there's a, there's a middle ground. And it's about attitude, and it's about what your intent is. Are you trying to scare people? Are you trying to bring up things of horror? And I know there's people on either side of that. I know that. I, I mean, I know there's good pastors, good hearts who dress up as Dracula and pop out of a casket to scare somebody. And I know there's good people that absolutely, positively... None of this happens in our house. I understand that. I understand that the greater principle is about love. And loving the people on either end of that scale. So this teacher of the law sees in Jesus some things that perhaps he didn't know about him before that. I think that's why he notices Jesus gave him a good answer. He wasn't expecting. He wasn't expecting the guy who might have been perceived as the enemy. A good answer. And his heart was such that he was willing to ask and listen. Verse 34, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, the teacher of the law had answered wisely. And that's interesting. The teacher had noticed that Jesus had given them a good answer. Now in verse 34, when Jesus saw that the teacher of the law had answered wisely, he said to him. It's a little different than the authorities that came and challenged him on what authority, and Jesus asked them a question and they refused to answer. He said, well, neither am I going to answer. Here, he continues to engage. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. I think this is kind of pointing out that maybe he was part of that group who had come to interrogate Jesus and had hung around long enough to hear that Jesus was giving a good answer and that he was getting close and now nobody else is going to push it anymore. But he says this to him. You are not far from the kingdom of God. He's so close. He's agreeing with Jesus that it's not about the offerings. And it's not about the sacrifices. It's about loving God. Recognizing who God is. And loving Him with all you've got. That's more important than all these other things. Interesting, this is in, in kind of contrast to some of the other encounters he's had recently. I mean, the rich guy who he's told, you lack one thing. And if you were here for part of that discussion, we talk about that one thing was really the follow me part. I think this teacher of the law is so close, he's starting to understand that the old system is broken. What I have been invested in so much is broken. That love is better than, it's more important than, but those things are still there. I'm still going to hang on to those, but put love ahead. And when she says, you are not far from the kingdom of God, I think he's telling me, you're so close. You just need to follow me. Believe in me. Believe that what I'm about to do, and again, this is, this is 
right before he's crucified. Believe in what I'm about to do being the offering, the sacrifice given out of love that takes away any other offering. That what I do doesn't take away um, a, a sin for a day. It doesn't take away a, a, a yearly issue. You can do this you know, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly and be good. What I do out of love removes all those others because this is it. This is the offering. This is the sacrifice. So close. Follow me. See, this is when I talked earlier about Norman Greenbaum's song, Spirit in the Sky. And I said he's close, he's got the gospel form, but he doesn't quite have it all together. I didn't give you all the verses. The next one. The next one is the, ah, you're close. You talk about Jesus being a friend and recommending you to the Spirit of the sky. Being your advocate before God when the time of judgment comes and our sins are presented, Jesus stands up in our defense and says, I've already paid it, Your Honor. I recommend him to the Spirit. I, I can buy all that, but this next verse, Norman missed the boat. He made a really good song that's still being sung 50 years later. But he missed it on this. When he said, I could write a gospel song, he could write in the gospel genre. He could write in, in the musical style, and he could write lyrics that kind of fit that. But he missed it with this next verse. Never been a sinner. I never sinned. I got a friend in Jesus. So you know that when I die, he's going to set me up. With the spirit in the sky. Oh, set me up with the spirit in the sky. That's where I'm going to go when I die. When I die and they lay me to rest, I'm going to go to the place that's the best. Go to the place that's the best. Well, Norman, if your thought is you've never been a sinner and you've never sinned, Jesus wants to be your friend. He wants to recommend you. And you are not far from the kingdom of God. One thing you have to do is recognize that the sacrifice was for you because of your sin. You're that close. But you've missed the boat. And I think that speaks to a lot of us. We talk about Jesus being our friend. We talk about um, the things that God can do. We talk about uh, the encouragement we get from reading scripture. But if we never get to the point of saying, I am a sinner. And accept the blood of Christ as my payment. To take away my sin. To recognize that he died in my place. And I claim that. Until we get to that point. We might be close. We're not far from the kingdom of God. But we are not yet. Now, I got to tell you. I might be misreading the lyrics. It could be that Norman Green Mom in writing that was writing from the perspective of because I've got a friend in Jesus and because I have this relationship and I have established it and I have prayed for forgiveness and have accepted him as my Lord and Savior, then before the spirit in the sky, I am blameless. I am righteous in him and I've never been a sinner, never sinned. But I don't think that's what he's saying. I don't think that's what he's saying. And if we start to make those claims and we give testimony about what Jesus has done for me, but we have not asked him to forgive my sins, if we haven't believed on him, 
if we've claimed Jesus as just another ritual, if we say, well, I, I, I have to be, he is my friend and he is going to recommend me because I was baptized. When everybody else in my grade got baptized, I got baptized. Or when I was out at that camp and they, were, they had a, a service and people were crying and they started baptizing me, well, I got baptized. Was that just a ritual? Was that a sacrifice? Was that an offering being lifted up? Or did you accept Jesus? See, because, I mean, I'm Baptist, and I believe in baptism. I believe that folks should be immersed and, and follow in that. But I do not believe that that water saves anybody, only the blood of Jesus. And so this Halloween, All Saints Eve, as we think about who are the saints of the church, those who have believed in Jesus Christ, those who have been washed by His blood, sanctified and set apart. As I hear Norman Greenbaum singing in my mind, in my mind about Spirit in the Sky. We talk about Reformation Sunday. What does it really take? And we talk about faith. It's, it's the love of Jesus given for us if we accept it. And if that's the case, when I die and they lay me to rest, I'm going to go to the place of the best. When I lay, the, when I lay me down to die, I'm going up to the Spirit of the sky. I've got a friend in Jesus. Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for what has been done through Jesus Christ to open the doors of heaven for us. To take away the sin of the world. To take away my sin. To in love be the perfect once and for all sacrifice. To in love welcome us home. We thank you for Jesus Christ. And we pray that you will use us to speak that name. To share with those who will notice. Those who will listen. That they too may know the Jesus that saved me. This is our prayer in His holy and precious name. Amen. I invite you to sing with me our, our closing hymn today, May the Mind of Christ, My Savior. If you're using our hymnal, this is hymn number 483. I'm going to caution you. What's in the worship packet has um, an extra verse written there. Um, because our hymnal has six verses. And I couldn't find six verses to, to print uh, as a PDF for you here. Um, so I hand wrote in the sixth verse. So if you're using your worship pack, my handwriting is atrocious when it's big. It gets horrid when it's small. That last line, the line six, let me just read it to you. So if you're looking at your worship packet right now, you can kind of get in your mind what it was I was trying to scribble down there. That last line, may his beauty rest upon me as I seek the lost to win. And may they forget the channel, see only him. Now, I, I, I was tempted to leave that out of the worship pack and tell you, those of you singing from the hymnal to just skip that last verse. But I really like that end. May they forget the channel, seeing only Him. Me standing here doing what I am doing today is not about me. It's about Jesus. And frankly, if you walk out of here and forget what I said, if you forget what song I talked about, if you forget that I was still wearing my October pink, I'm good with that.
as long as you remember Jesus. I am not here, no matter how many cameras we've got going, for you to see me, but to see Jesus. And when we're doing the things of Jesus, it's not so that we could pat our own backs or toot our own horns. It's so that we can show the world Jesus. Let's sing it. May the mind of Christ, my Savior, hymn number 48, or in your worship pack. surprise when people get online and try to find uh, where we are or when we are. Receive now the benediction. Go. Go. Go in the name of Jesus. Go in that name, the only name by which you may be saved. Go. Go with a friend in Jesus who will recommend you to the Spirit in the sky. Go. 
in his name, wherever you are, be a blessing and be blessed. Amen.